Hello, I'm Sam Waterston, and this is The Visionaries. Gandhi once said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. If this is true, how will our nation be judged? How do the lives of our animals represent our nation's commitment to the ideals of a humane society? Today, over six million dogs and cats are euthanized in this country each year because they have nowhere to go no home or family to care for them. But in San Francisco, this sad legacy is coming to an end because in 1994, the San Francisco Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals made a bold commitment that no adoptable cat or dog in San Francisco would be killed. Today, under the leadership of President Ed Sayers, the Society has innovative programs that make the San Francisco SPCA a compassionate model for other humane societies to follow. Society's first awareness of the animal issue happens around the 1870s. And the awareness came around carriage horses. And that just led to form a society that said, there's other animal issues, there's other animal treatment that we should be concerned about. San Francisco SPCA is the fourth oldest SPCA in the country, and we began to be the first animal control and care agency for the city. We no longer serve the city of San Francisco for animal care and control, and we gave up that contract in 1989, so literally over 100 years of serving that capacity, uh, we began to change the paradigm, and it is one of the most important paradigm shifts in the humane society industry which is to suggest that it is the governmental function to operate the open door facility and to respond to those who are cruel to animals, to do the regulatory part of the animal relationships in the city. And the Humane Society is the organization that works to save the lives and implement the preventatives. And splitting that responsibility has enabled us to accomplish incredible things. When you get to save an animal's life, when you get to change an animal's life that's had three or four homes and, and find a permanent placement and rehabilitate that animal medically or behaviorally, you have had a deep, meaningful moment in your life. I think the basis of almost all of San Francisco SPCA's programs are, for me, the concepts of value and inclusion. And there are always going to be, in areas around cities and in rural areas, a feral cat population. And you can have a program where you don't deal with that at all and realize you're going to have a surplus of kittens that come from that source, or begin to partner with the feral cat colony caregivers. These are companion animals who've been oftentimes uh, lost. Many people just leave them. They treat them like things. And they're abandoned and they have to fend for themselves. And when they revert to a natural state, this is what we call a feral cat. In every city, there are people out there who care for feral cats. Hi, a group of those people came to us and said, we need help. They said that the number one thing they need is to uh, control the numbers of cats out on the streets. You can take one can. I think I have a I first got involved with this colony when Barbara called me and discovered the, all these cats out here. And um, there were many people feeding them and no one had thought about fixing them. What the Feral Cat Assistance Program does is provide the same love and attention that we give our shelter cats and that people give their own cats to the cats uh, that live on the streets. We trap them, we take them in, they get fixed, and then we release them. But to identify them, we have their ears tipped. In the beginning, it was very easy trapping all these little guys. They just fell right for it. And now we're further on in the trapping. It's very difficult to get them because they've all seen it done or they've all heard from the other cats what goes on. And, and it's really tough. You just have to catch a new one and hope 
that you can, you know, bring it in. This is one of the males. One of the males? Oh, well mm -hmm. done. Excellent. Great. Do you want me just Five days a week, no appointment necessary. People can come in, okay. drop off a feral cat, and we will spay or neuter the cat, do a health yeah. check, provide vaccinations, any routine medical care. And um, we offer you the $5 reward. You can pick that up tonight you if you like it. to donate it. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Helps us keep all the costs low or free. And they pick the cat up at the end of the day. They watch the cat for a day or two to make sure the cat's recovering okay. And then the cat gets placed back out, either in the alleyway or the park or wherever the cat was trapped. And that caretaker will feed and care for the cat for the rest of the cat's life. And since we've started the program, we have altered over 8,000 feral cats. We've implemented this program since 1993. And we're really the only urban area in the country that is experiencing a decline in feral cat intake into animal care and control and it's by partnering with feral cat colony caregivers in an educational way. Let them access your services in our veterinary hospital and spay neuter clinic as easily as possible and help support them in an educational way so they can just be more successful managing their colony. I don't have cats at home, but these are all my cats. All these 30 cats that I've fixed already I just, uh, it, it brings a lot of peace out of my day if I can break away from work and come here and see them and do a cat count and feed them and play with them. I know for myself, the reason I feel so dedicated to these animals is because they, the reason they're here is because someone didn't take care of a cat and they're, they're having to fend for themselves and they have to live as best they can and I love them. Our goal is to provide a complete safety net for every feral cat in the city. And so we also do what's called neonatal kitten care, and that is for kittens who are zero to four weeks old, they need to be fed around the clock 24 hours a day. On the streets, uh, life may be difficult and a mother cat may be killed, and so we'll take the kittens in and we'll bottle feed them and we'll socialize them and, and turn them into, uh, uh, into lovable, fun, people-friendly pets uh, and then adopt them here uh, at uh, the San Francisco SPCA. Well, I tend to get them when they're anywhere from a week to two weeks old, the little bottle feeders, sometimes older, and just really take care of them for until they're about eight or nine weeks old. And you bottle feed them until they're about four weeks, and then around four weeks you start weaning them from the bottle and start trying to get them to eat food. What is this? What? What? Go play. Just basically give them a lot of attention, and that makes them into very well-adjusted cats. With little kittens like this, the, the best thing you do is you just want them to learn that uh, they can trust you, so I like to feed them food off of my hands uh, so that they become close to you and, and really play with them and just love them and kiss them a lot and, and get them used also to the sounds of your house. I flush the toilet or run water or things like that so that um, when they go into their adopting household that they won't be afraid of noises. So that when they go to the SPCA they come out to the windows and it always helps them get adopted a lot more easily. With little guys like this, I've only had them a week, and you can see they're already quite friendly. In San Francisco, since we started our program, the deaths of feral cats has dropped 73%. The majority of kittens coming into shelters are actually the offspring of feral cats, and the deaths of those kittens has dropped 81%, and in fact, in the next couple of years, we're going to completely eliminate the deaths of kittens in shelters, and the primary reason is our feral cat program. I think it just feels good to know that if I had not helped these five cats, they would have had to spend their life on the streets, and now I know they're going to get to go into wonderful homes, and that wouldn't have been an opportunity they would have had, would have had had I not helped them out. So it was, I think, it makes me feel good about myself every day. I think part of the ethic of the San Francisco SPCA in our community, again, is to speak about the value of animals. And we have a history with animals in service and animals in visitation to hospitals and nursing homes to, again, show their value therapeutically. Good girl. See you in a 
minute. Animal assisted therapy is very therapeutic. It's been shown in, in many ways from studies about blood pressure and stress reduction just to state of mind and mood. Hospitals request visits from as often as once a week, sometimes once a month, as well as assisted living centers, group homes for children, almost every sort of health care and living institution you can imagine. Good girl. I have a visitor for you today. This is kiddo. Most people really love it and have even like large dogs sometimes that will come up onto the bed with the person and you know start to settle in and a lot of patients they don't want the dogs to leave it makes the hospital feel like it's a home she's a kisser uh, is that good do you like that <laughs> i think the powerful thing about it is is that a patient doesn't have to feel defended when an animal comes to to, to greet them. They don't have to feel embarrassed about tubes or being bald or whatever their problem is or their situation. They know the dog isn't judging them. So they're relaxed and can interact in a much more relaxed way. She's a pretty girl, huh? I think that the animals that come in here are really serving a purpose and it's almost like you can see that in the animal that they know that they're doing a good thing for the patients here and you know it seems to benefit both the animal and the the patient we visit 120 hospitals and institutions in san francisco and the nursing care staff and the doctors endorse it completely and the patients look forward to it tremendously because it is that capacity of dogs or cats that bring this unconditional love and tactile experience that if you are in an institution is a, is a rare experience. You give the guy a kiss. It's very gratifying to do animal assisted therapy work. Uh, you get much appreciation, thanks, uh, a lot of emotional responses of joy and sadness and everything you can imagine. I give the animals the credit. I'm sort of just the chauffeur, but it's very rewarding to hear how people feel better and how they look forward to our visits. Oh, I'll rescue you. Look at that. Animals are valuable in our lives, and if so, they should be included in our lives as much as possible. So adoption outreach is something we pioneered 20 years ago, and it was rather controversial. It was not immediately accepted. But now, today, a humane society that doesn't have an outreach adoption program is criticized. And it's literally, if you look at around the country where homeless dogs and cats are being kept, obviously a way to increase adoption is to make them more accessible to people. And so you bring them to areas where people are and you bring them to areas during the hours where people are able to have a, a good interaction and, and a good adoption screening process. So we operate 29 sites around the city to enable and facilitate someone to have the opportunity to adopt a homeless dog or cat. Um, we're going to a place called Levi Plaza, which is um, a site that we do every Thursday. We've done the site for quite some time. Um, it used to just be a one day a week site and we've made it two days a week. Well, we come out to a location and uh, we set up our site with uh, usually a bunch of kittens and a few cats, adult cats as well. And, uh, well, the people of the public, they walk by and uh, on their lunch break, they're during the afternoon sometime, they come down and they see the kittens and well, everyone's kind of drawn to kittens. So they come by and they pet them and they, you know, play with them a little bit. A lot of times they adopt the kitten from there or sometimes they don't even adopt a kitten. They just have a question they want to ask. A lot of people just love that there's the cat outside and they can come during work and they can you know get a little kitten fix and you know make their day a little bit better because outreach adoption was a new program for us there was somehow the logic that if you left your main facility and adopted animals at another location it would cause the adoptions to be impulsive that for some reason you could not implement the same screening procedures and conversations that you could in your facility we try to aim people away from doing spontaneous buys. And you can generally tell when someone's doing a spontaneous buy, like how interested they actually are in the kitten and how interested they are in the whole process of it. And so when you really talk to them, we give them a, about a half an hour to 45 minute uh, screening process. 
I hear it's a little hard because, you know, they're in the little cages mm -hmm. and stuff. And there you can be more social. We kept and, very know, specific records on, on the retention rate of the animals being adopted from off-site versus the animals being adopted from the facility. And our return rate was lower with, with outreach than it was with our own facilities. It was just one of those fears of it being a new strategy that just made people think this couldn't possibly work. Yeah, give them the number and uh, if you want to let them know they're actually... It's worked fabulously and now hundreds of agencies do outreach and adoption. In this case, she obviously went back to her office and let her family know, which is what we do encourage because you don't want to come home and surprise people with a cat. She'd go down to the Maddie's Adoption Center and let them know that she saw a cat on outreach. A cat attendant will go down there, bring the kitten to her, and they can go into a room if they choose and see how the cat socializes with them. I take people through the process of adopting. From the moment that they walk in, I direct traffic, let them know where the dogs and the cats are, and then once they come up with the name of a cat or a dog that has caught their eye and they've gone and spent some time with the animal, then I'll give them some more information that we have in our computer, uh, behavioral and medical information on the animal, and then basically walk them through the adoption. The Maddie Center, I think, does two things. The environment uh, pleases the public. The public comes in and sees animals content and in this home-like environment and, and satisfied. And the animals, of course, it's almost like a second home. So they are literally more content and more comfortable. And so the interaction, instead of someone adopting the animal out of pity for its circumstances, we have a much richer exchange in the adoption screening to say, these are the animal's issues, these are the animal's behaviors, and the people are motivated by understanding this is a lifetime responsibility and I understand what these animals' needs are. There are certain people who say, you know, I didn't pick this cat, this cat picked me, things like that, you know, and, or they come in and they say, I, I had absolutely no intention of adopting an animal today. Then something happens and there's a spark and they end up going home with a cat or a dog. You can be a free cat. Adoption programs for humane societies, I mean, there has always been the focus that this is a lifetime responsibility. What's happened in our favor is that people are willing to take a lifetime responsibility for a dog or cat who is 8 or 10 or 12. I've been in the humane movement for about 25 years and animal dogs and cats over three years of age were basically had a death sentence because everyone wanted puppies. But somehow we've been able to talk to the public about the enrichment and the value of saving the life of a homeless dog or cat. So it's clear that it's for their lifetime but now people are, are looking at that lifetime and saying I'll be a part of this phase. I'll own this dog or cat for its last five years. And that's a real a shift that's helped us tremendously. Congratulations. Take care, folks. The Adoption Pact we signed with the City of San Francisco on April 1st, 1994, and that was literally to guarantee any animal, any dog and cat that was categorized as adoptable, an adoptable meaning no behavioral or medical intervention required before placement, that any animal that fell into that category would be guaranteed a home in the City of San Francisco. And that was revolutionary because realized the, the rest of the country is euthanizing its surplus population and we are now able to make that adoptable guarantee. By saving the adoptables, the next population would be the treatables. And treatable medical or behavioral conditions could be minor from kennel cough or an upper respiratory infection to things that are fairly complex and require uh, long-term remediation. I like this female too. How should those treatable animals be housed? Well, their conditions were not two-week conditions. Their conditions could be things that take three and four months. So we looked in the creation of the Maddie Center to create this home-like environment because they were going to be here for long periods of time. And a lot of their, these dogs and cats' histories was unsuccessful experiences in the home. And whether it was destruction of things in the house or chewing or things like that, we wanted to see them in a home-like environment so that we could implement the behavior rehabilitation to enable them to be successful in the next home. That was very good. Yeah.
All of the dogs that come here, of course, are wonderful, but they don't necessarily have the manners that would make them fit into a household the way that a potential dog owner may want. And a lot of the dogs that we come in have had some problems or have not had any training. So there are specific issues that we address to make them fit in better into the human community. So humane societies now advocate behavior training, offering public classes for dog obedience, uh, offering free classes for the animals adopted from the facility because animals and the people need to understand each other. And quite honestly, it's the people who need the education. The animals are really pretty straightforward about what their needs are. Very good. Good girl. Out. One of the things as we go forward that we're trying to address is to be able to delve deeper and deeper into the population, which means not just treating the issues that are fairly surface and fairly easily resolvable, but as we continue to try and figure out what in a kennel environment we can do for the dogs that have issues that in the past would have meant that they were not placeable. Down. She's Oreo. Um, she's one of the more kinds of severe types of problems that we will attempt. Her particular problem is she's got severe dog aggression. She's wonderful with people, but we suspect she may have been a purpose-bred fighting dog. Um, and so genetically and possibly her early environment have all been geared to make her kind of basically a dog attacking machine, which is not her fault. And so we're trying to develop a way to get her so that she can live in society and not be a danger to other dogs. And that one gets you her favorite thing. This whole idea of behavioral rehab of shelter dogs is a field in its infancy and it's not really known uh, what the limits are, what we're going to be able to accomplish and we're sort of refining the technology as we go along. Nobody's ever tried to do this before. What we're hoping is to develop some protocols and then once we've refined that, be able to export it to other shelters who eventually are in our position. Thank you. A lot of these dogs have got fabulous redeeming qualities to them and it's so nice to know that, that they didn't have to die or receive a death sentence because they had a behavior problem. Them, that they're not awful animals, um, they just got a problem. Watch, excellent. The main goal of our program is to have dogs living happily and successfully with their people long term so that they find a home initially, they stay in the home and they're successful so that the dogs who didn't used to have options have options and that they don't have to come to our facility hopefully at all and they just go throughout their whole lives in their happy home. We're on a road that has no end and each day we begin again Love's not just something that we're in It's something that we do The companion relationship, I think, brings uh, simply a greater quality of life to people. And the San Francisco SPCA, to me, seems to be becoming more of what I would say the animal well-being center, the place where animals are in treatment and in rehabilitation and readying themselves for their role with their human companions. It's no longer the 19th century version of processing cruelty or processing surpluses. It's a place where animals get the treatment they need and wait for the right match. There's no request to big or small. We give ourselves, we give our all. Love is in some place that we fall. It's something that we In most major American cities, only 25 to 30 percent of homeless animals are adopted. Last year, 78 percent of all cats and dogs who entered the shelter system in San Francisco found new, loving homes. Thanks to the commitment of the people at the SPCA, San Francisco has become the safest urban city for cats and dogs in the United States.